Dallas had a uh, women's ministry bake sale that she was going to participate in, and so it got a little bit last moment, and she baked a cake. She made an angel food cake, uh, and she pulled it out of the oven, and when she did, she noticed that the center had dropped flat, and she began to freak out. She didn't have enough time to make to bake another cake, so she pulled it out and said, what can I do? What can I do? And she figured it out. She went uh, into the bathroom, and she got a roll of toilet paper, put it right in the middle of that cake, iced it over real pretty. I mean, it was a masterpiece. She gave it to her daughter to take to the bake sale, and she gave her daughter money with the instructions that as soon as the sale opens, you buy this cake and you bring it back home. I do not want to be embarrassed by anybody biting into that toilet paper. And so the daughter took it to the bake sale. When the bake sale opened, the daughter was the first one in the door, ran to where she thought the cake may be, and guess what? It was not there, nowhere to be found. So she came home and told her mom, Alice, and said, Mom, the the cake was not there. It was already gone when I got in there to buy it. And she started to, you know, hyperventilate a little bit and freak out about that. But then there was nothing she could do. She didn't know where it went. She didn't know who had it. She couldn't tell anybody. So she just said, you know what? Whatever. The next day, she was invited to play some games at the house of one of the leading women of the church. And they went in and played those games, and after it was over, a fancy lunch was served, and at the end of that fancy lunch, out walked the hostess, the, the leading lady of the church, and she had a cake on a platter and brought it out to the table, and the lady, uh, Alice, saw it, and she examined it and said, that's my cake, I've got to tell her about it, and she started to get up out of her seat to go warn the hostess about this cake, but before she could get up, she heard another lady say, oh, what a beautiful cake, to which the hostess responded, thank you, I baked it myself. Now, you can imagine that little lie leading to a great amount of embarrassment. Earlier in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul wrote that we were to take off the old man as though we were taking off old ragged clothes, and that we were to put on the, the new man, the new woman, the new creation in Christ. And now in this rest of chapter 4, what he is doing is he is describing bits and pieces of what that new clothing looks like. And the first thing that he describes is our topic today, and that is this. The new man has no place in his life for lies, only for telling the truth. Let me show you what it says. Are you there? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25. Here's what he says. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Why should we tell the truth? Because number one, truthfulness is Christ-like. Truthfulness is Christ-like. Notice the very first thing that he says there in verse 25. He says, therefore, he's connecting this passage to the previous passage that he talked about, taking off the old self, putting on the new creation. He says, therefore, putting away lying. Another way, having put away falsehood. The idea is that this is a past event that once we have taken off the old man and we've put on the new man, what we have done is we have put off lying and we've put on the truth. Because remember, who is the new man that we put on ourselves? It is none other than Jesus Christ. When we are a new creation, we are a new creation in Christ. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives through me. My friends, we see here that that new life is none other than Jesus Christ. We have here, he says, you've put off lying. The word there is pseudos. We use the word pseudo to talk about something that is fake or false. 
We'll add pseudo to something after that to say a false or a fake thing. This idea of pseudo it means lying or falsehood. Let me give you a few passages of Scripture. I'm going to read these rather quickly. You might want to jot these down. John chapter 8, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 3 through 5. They bent their tongues like their bows. Lies and not faithfulness prevail in the land. For they proceed from one evil to another, and they do not take me into account. This is the Lord's declaration. Everyone has to be on guard against his friend. Don't trust any brother, for every brother will certainly deceive, and every friend spreads slander. Each one betrays his friend. No one tells the truth. They have taught their tongues to speak lies. They wear themselves out doing wrong. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 15. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. The major characteristic of someone who does not know Jesus is that they are living a lie. And it shows with what they say and what they do. In fact, Satan is not called the father of many things, but he's called the father of lies. Contrast that with these Bible verses. John chapter 3 and verse 33. The one who has accepted his testimony has affirmed that God is true. John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, verse 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him because he remains in you and will be in you. The Spirit of truth. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. John 4, 23. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in... Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. We are to leave falsehood behind. And we are to champion the truth. We saw in those verses that the devil is described by falsehood and lying. In those verses, God the Father is truth. God the Son is truth. God the Holy Spirit is truth. The Word of God is truth. The people of God celebrate truth. You are no more like Satan than when you are speaking lies. And you are no more like Jesus than when you speak the truth. My friends, we are to tell the truth because, first of all, truthfulness is Christ-like. Secondly, we are to tell the truth because truthfulness is is commanded. Truthfulness is commanded. Now we see in this text that he does not give us a suggestion. He does not give us encouragement. He gives us a command. The text there, speak the truth. The word speak means that you're talking it, but it is in the imperative, which means it's a command, not a suggestion, not advice. A command. We are commanded here to speak 
the truth. We are commanded in the Ten Commandments to speak the truth. You remember the Ten Commandment that says, Thou shalt not bear false witness. What does that mean? That means you're not supposed to tell lies. And if you flip that, what does that mean? It means you should speak the truth. All throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, it is expected and commanded of followers of Christ to speak the truth. Why would we not speak the truth? Why would we tell lies? Why would we exaggerate? Why would we cheat? Why, why would we cut corners? Why would someone do that? Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain got angry with Abel and he murdered him. God came to Cain and said, Cain, where is your brother? Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, I don't know where he is. And Cain told a lie, didn't he? And he lied to cover and to hide his sin. I'm sure that Christians don't do that today either. Do you remember when King David had a man, an Amalekite, that came to him? King Saul was chasing him, and King Saul was killed in a battle with the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. And this Amalekite came to David and had King Saul's crown and his armlets he had all the jewelry of King Saul that he wanted to give to King David. And the Amalekite claimed to have killed King Saul and was now making David king. But that's not what happened in the story. And we see that Saul fell on his own sword. But this Amalekite was lying to promote himself. I'm sure that no one in this room has ever done that before. My friends, there are multiple reasons that we tell lies and we are disobedient to this command that God has given us. And all of those lies boil down to one common denominator. Are you ready for it? A lack of faith in Jesus. We are, not supposed, we are not supposed to trust a lie to protect us. We are to trust Jesus to protect us. He is our refuge and strength. Amen? We, we are not supposed to justify sin and to cover up sin with lies, but we are to confess that sin because he's faithful and just to forgive us. And as long as we try to cover it, he will count it against us. But the minute we uncover it in confession, he wipes it away. We are not supposed to promote ourselves through lies. But we trust the Lord to provide for us. We seek first the kingdom of God that all these things might be given to us. My friends, the very basic purpose behind lying is a lack of trusting Jesus. In other words, whenever we tell lies we reveal that we don't trust Jesus we are commanded to trust Christ and to follow him and if you have taken off the old man and put on the new and you claim to trust Jesus with your life yet you continue in falsehood and cheating and lying you are betraying the very profession you have made because if you're full of lies, you don't really trust Jesus. We are truth tellers because it's Christ-like. We are truth tellers because it's commanded. And we are truth tellers because it is caring. Look back at the text at what he says here. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, 
each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. We are to speak truth to our neighbor. Well, one of the disciples asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? He asked that because he was trying to find a loophole. If my neighbor is just a person that lives beside me, then that means that I can tell lies to all of you and have no problem. But he says, who is our neighbor? And do you remember how Jesus responded to that disciple? Do you remember? He responded with a parable. It was a parable of the good Samaritan. I heard two of you answer that, so you, you can get into heaven five minutes faster, okay? That'd be great. I don't know if that's good or not, but you got it. The Good Samaritan. And in the Good Samaritan, I won't tell the whole story, but the idea was that this person who should have never been required or expected to meet the needs of another person because one was a Samaritan and one was a Jew, that Samaritan did minister to those needs, and he proved and he showed in that parable that everybody is our neighbor. Regardless of where they live, regardless of what they look like, regardless of who their parents are, regardless of what NFL team they cheer for. I mean, everybody is our neighbor. Then he says, beyond that, he says, because we are members of one another. In this human family, we are all interconnected. And the Bible says you are even more interconnected with the members of the household of God. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26, so if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now we see here that when you tell a lie, you end up hurting the one to whom you're lying. But when you tell the truth, even though it may be painful, in the end it will be helpful. I'm sure that you have experienced this before. You're getting ready to go somewhere, and that sweet woman that lives at your house comes in, and she has something on, and she says, Honey, how do I look in this? And at this point, you are wrong whichever way you go. Now you could say, uh, that don't look very good. You, you look like a sea cow. Let's not do that, you know. And then you come see me for marriage counseling right after that. Amen. I mean, that's what it is. That's what happens. You could be, you could be honest, you know. Or you say, <clears throat> it looks great. And she goes out, and she sees herself in a full-length mirror at the restaurant or wherever you are, and she figures out, it does not look great. And then, she chews you out on the way home from the restaurant. And then you come to see me for counseling. You got a problem. What do you do? Now, I don't really know exactly what to do here because my wife looks good in everything. <laughs> In fact, when she comes up to me, she says, James, do, does this dress look too good? You know, that's what she asks. And I say, yeah, baby, that probably looks too good for those people at church. We need to back it off a little bit. You know, that, that's the conversation we have at my house. But you could say something like, you know, that, that blue looks nice, but I, I really like you in that green dress. That'd be all right, wouldn't it, girls? That'd be okay. That'd be all right. Y'all better say I'd be all right. Cause <laughs> we got marriages in the balance up in here, okay? I'm just saying. <laughs> you may could say something like, well, I, don't, I don't know if that necessarily fits the occasion that we're doing today. It's not that it looks bad. It just don't fit the occasion. Now, you're not lying to them. You're not lying to them. You just not getting divorced that's all you're doing you just but the point is this if you tell someone 
that doesn't look very good. It's going to hurt them for a little bit. But it's going to save them further embarrassment and a deeper hurt in the future. Let me give you another example. Some churches, some preachers, do not want to offend anyone by telling them that what they're doing is a sin. And so they just, they won't, oh, it's no big deal. It's not a problem. Don't, everybody does that. Don't worry about that. Because the preacher does not want to offend anyone. But if a person goes through their life thinking that they're all good and that they don't need Jesus because they're not really a sinner, they're going to die one day and they're going to go to hell one day. And because that preacher was too cowardly to tell the truth, that person is going to be in hell cursing the name of that preacher for all eternity. No, no, friend. I would rather have you upset with me for telling you how it is. And you give your life to Christ and be saved. Then me want to be your close buddy friend that you love so much because all I tell you is good Positive things, but you spend eternity burning in hell. What is more loving, to call sin, sin, or to cover it over with a bunch of sugar on top? My friends, we tell the truth because we love people. Because we love them. The Bible says we speak the truth with love. That's why we are to be truth tellers. Do lies work? David told the lie to the priests at Nob or Nob. Later we find out King Saul had them all murdered for helping David. Got them killed. Satan's lie to Eve led to sin and death in the world. Cain's lie led to his rejection, being uh, had a mark put on him, and he was banished from his family. The Amalekite who came to David thinking he was going to say something great, that David was going to elevate him. Instead, David had him executed. All throughout the Bible, whenever someone lied, it always ended up bad. They do not work. Luke chapter 12, verse 2 through 3 says this, There is nothing covered that won't be uncovered, nothing hidden that won't be made known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in an ear in private rooms will be proclaimed on the mountain tops. You may see it as advantageous to tell a lie in the moment. But there will be payday someday for the lie that you tell. And as a follower of Christ, we cannot be full of falsehood, but we must be truth tellers. The father of lies shares lies with you and me every day. Some of the biggest lies are the ones that we tell ourselves. That sin is not that bad. It's not your fault. It was somebody else's fault. Oh, Jesus is so big. He has so many other things on his plate. He's not that worried about your little sin. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. We sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's something else. That's not really the Spirit of God speaking to you. You're, you're just stressed out. You're, you're just tired. You, you had something bad to eat this morning. That's not conviction of the Holy Spirit. You, you don't have time to walk down that aisle. You, you got people waiting on you to go eat lunch or to go about your day. Uh, you, don't, you, you have time to do that later. 
You don't have to worry about that right now. You've got plenty of time to confess that sin and to trust Jesus. You can do it tomorrow. You can do it next week. You don't have to do that today. These are the lies that we tell ourselves over and over. And what ends up happening, these are the lies that keep us from Jesus and send us to hell. How do we combat this? John 8, 32. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth is, we are all sinners. And God is so holy and so perfect, and we are so not, that He cannot allow us with our sin into His presence. And so when we die, instead of being in the presence of God in heaven, our sin keeps us from God in a place called hell forever. The truth is, we're all in trouble because of our sin. The truth is also that God looked at us and said, I don't want them going to hell. I'm going to do something about it. And He sent Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, to live a sinless life, to be executed on the cross, not for crimes He committed, but for our sins. And His death on the cross, while mysterious, paid the price of our sins so that we might be saved. And the truth of the matter is, we cannot have the forgiveness of Jesus without repentance and faith. We must accept this gift by turning from sin and trusting Jesus Christ. How do we do that? The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For some of you in this room, it's time to quit speaking lies to yourself. Jesus is moving in your heart. He is drawing you to Himself. You must respond. If you'd like to know more about First Baptist Lafayette, visit our website at fbclaf.org.